right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to beautiful Gig Harbor. Uh, don't worry, I, I know some of you, when, when uh, they switch the feed, will look at the transit and the tripod and say, it's crooked, it's leaning. That's okay, it's supposed to be that way. So we're gonna straighten this up a little later. Do you sometimes feel your spiritual life is lacking something? It's a question. It's a question that my wife proposed uh, earlier this week on Facebook. And I thought it was very apropos to start out this message with the, the same question. I mean, it's a question that most Christians ask themselves every now and again. Unfortunately, when society looks at questions like this, she gets quite a bit of negative response. You know, society looks down on these type of questions because it implies we're lacking something or there's something wrong with us. Or how about we need someone stronger than ourselves, meaning God. Of course, society as a whole does not look to God for anything. But Christians usually only ask these types of questions when they're going through a trial, when they're going through some type of hardship, when they desperately need God, or when they doubt that God is even with them, or when they can't see God in their lives. In reality, God is always there. He always has our best interest at hand, and for each of us, it may be something different. The problem, Satan likes to confuse us. He likes to trip us up. He throws roadblocks in our way. He likes to put roadblocks in our minds. And he makes us feel inadequate. And he interjects doubt into our lives. It's one of his greatest weapons. If he could get us to doubt, we lose confidence. And then we tend to separate ourselves from God. We give into depression, we give into anxieties, we give into things that, you know, we allow our minds to travel to places that they really shouldn't travel to because it's not true. But these types of questions should actually spark us. It should spark us to dig deeper into God's work. It should also inspire us to overcome whatever issue that we've been struggling with, whether it be an issue that just came up or something that we've been struggling with for years and years and years. And these type of questions actually get us closer to God. You know, during the dark and dreary days of winter, and I think I've said this before here in the Pacific Northwest, we have the cloud, as we say, moves in late October sometimes, mostly in November and December, and doesn't move till sometimes in April. And it rains continuously somewhere in the Seattle area, Seattle, Olympia, Tacoma, this whole big region. And, you know, uh, we tend to isolate ourselves more. We stay inside our houses more. We become cooped up where, you know, we don't get out. We don't fellowship as much. We don't see people. Our electronic age has put a division between us because it's so easy to text. It's so easy to just send off an email instead of, uh, I mean, when was the last time any of us physically sat down and wrote a letter. I can't remember the last time I did. I mean, it's so much easier to sit down and send an email. But during these last, these, these dark, dreary days of winter, it's a perfect time in our lives to go back to the basics. Spent a lot of time in, in Wisconsin. We raised our kids in Wisconsin. I am not a Green Bay Packer fan. I want to make that, you know, solid right here. I was born and raised in Chicago. I bleed blue, bears all the way. But I am a big fan of Vince Lombardi. And Vince Lombardi, whenever the Packers would lose a game, would come back to the practice field on Monday morning and hold up a football. 
And his first statement was, this is a football. And he would go back to the basics. So how do we go back to the basics when it comes to Christianity? Do you remember that spark, that fire that burned inside you when you first came in contact with God's truth? It's something that just you couldn't get enough of. You couldn't read your Bible enough. You couldn't pray enough. You couldn't sit down with God's people enough. For us second, third, and fourth generation Christians, it might be a little different because sometimes we feel we've been living God's way of life for the whole time. But what about that time when you really first started to understand what was being taught on the Sabbath day? When you're sitting in Bible study and something finally dinged, you know, that light bulb went off in your head. Well, the growth of our Christian lives depends on a solid foundation. It depends on that solid foundation to start building, to start the building process and to, and to maintain an environment for a stable spiritual growth based on what God needs to build on. So today we're going to look at three keys to building and maintaining a foundation for Christian growth. There's a lot of things that stop our Christian growth. You know, I mean, you could take a second or two and just write one or two things down in your notes, but ask yourself this question. What are some of the things that demand our time? I mean, time is something we only have 24 hours in a day. It never changes. It's just one constant in our lives. But things like to eat at our time and divide our time. I mean, families. Laura and I had a family of six. We had four sons growing up, and they were all real close in age. There are times when, you know, parent-teacher conferences came and Laura would start at one end of the school, I would start at the other end of the school, and we'd meet in the middle because we had all these teachers for all four of our kids we had to see. What about those of us in the corporate industry? You know, when you climb higher in the corporate ladder, there's more demands on your time. You stop becoming a hourly employee become a salary employee and then you start working longer you have longer meetings those meetings turn into lunch lunch turns into dinner turns into late evening meetings well, what if out if you're a business owner it doesn't matter if it's a large corporation or a small business owner if you have employees underneath you they depend on you now you're not only worrying about your own little family but you're worrying about all these families all these mouths you have to feed what about those farmers? You know, during the springtime and the harvest, they are so busy. We used to live in the middle of nowhere, this little town in northern Illinois called Kirkland, Illinois. It was six blocks by four blocks. Everything else outside the area was all farmland. During the springtime, you see the farmers out there night and day. During harvest, the same thing, headlights. I mean, to be black as black can be, and as you're driving down the road, you see this glow out in the middle of the field. Well, that's the headlights from the farmer who's still working. What about construction workers? Most of us don't think about them. But during the uh, spring, summer, and, and fall time, you're usually working sun up to sun down. As a land surveyor, when I was out in the field, I'm no longer in the field, but when I was out in the field, there were a lot of times I was meeting my crew at five o'clock in the morning to drive to a job site to be there before the construction crews got there so we can get set up so we can get them going. And a lot of times we were there till after they left so we can keep going and get things set up for the next day. Time is, is something that we all have the same of, but yet how we distribute it at that time is differently. And when it comes to our Christian growth, there is no one model that works for everybody. There's no one end all to be all. Just do this for this much time, 
during the day and you're good to go. As growing up, I, I've been told, well, you have to pray for 30 minutes a day. You have to study for this much a day. Sometimes it doesn't even wind up that way. You know, some of us, you know, can only get uh, maybe one scripture in or two scriptures in. It, our time and how we do it. And some say, well, you got to study in the morning. You got to pray in the morning. You know, sometimes it's not best for us to do that. You have to choose a time that's best for you, for your optimum growth. This Christian growth is different for each and every one of us. So I thought as a visual aid, which might be helpful, I'd bring out my surveyor's instrument and my tripod. Now, this is one of the pieces of equipment that I used to use long time ago. Nowadays, the art of surveying has gone the way of electronics, just like everybody else. They use GPS most of the time or electronic instruments where you set the instrument up and it follows you around basically by carrying the rod and they've lost the art of how the principles of land surveying actually work. But when you look at the tripod, as you could see it now, it's set up kind of at an angle. A lot of times um, when you're out in the field, you never know what you're going to be set up on. You know, this is a flat surface. It's in the house. It's carpeted. You know, you might be out on a sidewalk, nice and flat, on the side of a hill, uh, on the side of a railroad ballast, over a wall, over a fence which is some of the most difficult places to set up. And there's Christian analogies that we can go in with that, you know, trying to grow or trying to set up a, a balanced tripod over a fence is very difficult. Very different terrains, different conditions. Is it sunny out? Is it raining? Is, it, is the ground muddy? Is it snowing? In the middle of winter time in Wisconsin, uh, if you don't bury your legs, the metal on the legs, if the sun is hitting it, can actually thaw the ground unevenly and throw your tripod out of balance. These are some of the things you have to think about all the time. It's easy to carry in. A lot of times you're walking very far, but yet the process in setting up a tripod is always the same. Sometimes you have to do it multiple times a day. In your Christian growth, sometimes you have to pray multiple times a day. Maybe you get a chance to grab your Bible during lunch. You know, maybe you have a little break where you can grab your Bible. Or, you know, maybe you have one at home in every room of the house. Um, I have... You know, multiple Bibles that I've picked up through the years that they're stored throughout the house. But at the same time, um, I read from an iPad for my notes, which means I have Bible software on my iPad. With the same Bible software is on my phone. So no matter where I am at, I've got a Bible with me. But when you come back to this surveyor's tripod, you'll notice there's three legs. Each leg is adjustable. I mean, just by loosening the screw, I can let this slide back all the way. I can push forward, depending on how you want to set it up. But the idea is to get a, a balance and stable foundation. And you have to start with the legs of the tripod, okay? And the reason is, is because they can have a great amount of adjustment. And just by slowly manipulating these legs. Now, if I was in the field, I would be doing this a lot faster. But just by slowly manipulating, sorry, I can't see that close with these glasses. You could see I have a stable base. I have a flat base, according to this bubble on the side of my tripod, I am in the middle. This, you can push down on it, it's not gonna move. 
I've had tripods out in the middle of fields and heavy winds. They won't move. Um, it's strong. It's a good foundation for your instrument. Yes, if you knock into it, it will uh, tumble over. But one thing you'll notice is even when the tripod is out of balance, and you can tell that the instrument is out off plumb, it turns, it rotates, it moves up and down, it does all the rotations it needs to. You can read angles, you can record those angles, but you're getting false data because the instrument isn't balanced. In order to get proper balance or proper information, your instrument has to be balanced. You have to have a good foundation to start with because underneath the instrument, there is one center point. We call it a dimple. It could be a pinprick in the top of a nail. It's a very small thing. The center of our universe for this setup would be God. Okay. God is always there. It's what we're supposed to build everything around. It's God's way of life, the scriptures. So what I'm doing here is fine tuning, making little adjustments in the thumb screws on top to make sure that I am totally balanced. And only when I am totally balanced can I go forward and do my work. Now, sometimes, depending on where you're set up, this takes a while. Sometimes you're you're over the you think you're over the point, but you're not really over the point. You have to take the whole thing down and start all over again. But these three legs of our tripod, we can draw a analogy. Now, if, if you want to draw a picture in your notes, go right ahead of three separate legs. Label one of those legs prayer. Label another leg Bible study. And label that third leg as meditation. Those three legs, prayer, Bible study, meditation, are the basis for our spiritual life. It keeps a good, solid foundation. So let's go ahead and start our first uh, leg we're going to look at is prayer. Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Matthew 6. We're going to go to the model prayer. But there's also a couple verses before the model prayer that gives us some basic instructions that sometimes we don't read. We're going to read through those. When we think about the model prayer as a template, as a guide, not what we're supposed to be actually praying, but as a guide for us to understand as a template is for us to build on of how to build our prayer life. But the instructions given, starting in verse 5, Matthew 6, verse 5 says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the street that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Remember the example in Luke 18 of the Pharisee and the tax collector? That's what we're talking about. The Pharisee stood and boasted not being like other men. And then he said, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. He's using himself three times, referring to himself three times in one sentence. Prayer should never be about our accomplishments, but about what God can do through us, giving God the glory, not taking glory on ourselves. Verse 16, or, or Matthew 5, verse 16, says, Let your light shine before men, so they will see you, but they're supposed to see God. So the rest of the scripture goes that they may see 
your good works and glorify your father. So we're not supposed to be out there letting people see what we're doing necessarily to glorify us. That's what this Pharisee was doing. Verse 6 goes on for another instruction. He says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in heaven uh, in the secret place, and, uh, and your Father and sees you in secret will reward you openly. So here's a couple things here. We're to pray to God, God the Father, who is where? He is in heaven. But we're supposed to do it in a place where it's quiet and we can focus, we can concentrate. You know, the Bible says go into a room, close the door, shut the door. It's basically, it's telling us to find a place that is all our own. Find a place where you can talk to God comfortably. Remember, it's your side of the conversation with God. It doesn't mean that's the only place where you can talk to God. I mean, there's a lot of times, um, you know, when I'm up in the mountains, I'll pray. Find a nice quiet spot and pray. Or, you know, I just passed a horrific accident on a highway. I may say a little prayer right there. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, I have to wait till I get home to get into a room and kneel down and pray. Right then and there, I felt motivated to pray because of the accident to help those people. It's the same thing in our prayer lives, wherever we are. There, there's nothing that says we can't just say a little prayer for somebody else. You see something happening, asking God to jump in there and help them. Verse 7 goes on, says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. When you look at the, the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer underneath, how many times if you know you're watching a, a tv show or, or even a, a movie and somebody's before a priest and they say for your penance do um you know five hail marys and and five uh um you know our fathers vain repetition okay S some religions do that and then when you look at your favorite bible stories you know, do you see the prayers that are actually printed there? I mean, Scott has been going through the story of Joseph. And there are four places in Genesis that the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. After Joseph was thrown in prison in, in Genesis 39, verse 21, you know, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Now, if you're thrown in prison, you would think God has forsaken you. Where is God? I'm in prison. Why didn't he keep me out of prison? Well, maybe there's a reason, like with Joseph, that uh, he was there. But at the same time, you don't see any of Joseph's prayers. But if Joseph didn't pray to God, would he actually be there with him? What about Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah in Daniel 2? When Nebuchadnezzar has that uh, the first recorded dream there, Daniel 2, is going to kill all the wise men, which these four young lads were part of the wise men. Daniel finds out, goes to the rest of them, and it talks about them praying for the answer that is needed. It doesn't give the prayer. What about Esther and Mordecai and what they were going through with Haman and what he was trying to do? These prayers are not written in the Bible because God knows that if we have similar situations, we would actually look at those and pray those same prayers instead of getting our own words 
taking our words from our heart. Let's drop down to verse 8. It says, verse 8 says, Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Even though God knows, ask. Ask. When we ask, we realize what we're really asking God to do. And it's something that we need to understand when we pray. And we're asking God to intercede for us. We're asking God to intercede that something that can't be scientifically or logically explained. We're asking him to do something that most people don't understand. How many stories have you heard of where somebody was sick or afflicted and go in and now they're not sick or afflicted and the doctors have no explanation for it? Well, we have an explanation for it. It's God our Father. So now we come down to verse 9 and we're starting into the model prayer. It says, in this manner, here's your template. Therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, recognizing who God is. He is our Father. It doesn't say pray to Jesus. It says pray. Jesus Christ here is giving us an example to pray to God in heaven. He says, hallowed be your name. Praising God. Your kingdom come. How many times do we pray for God's kingdom? We never know when it's going to come, but we know we want it to come because we know what the kingdom stands for. It says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a reference to our daily needs. Substance. These physical bodies need physical substance to survive. In some commentaries, they reference the manna that God gave to ancient Israel as an example. This is what ancient Israel needed to sustain physical life. God gave them manna when they needed it. God gave them water. God gave them everything that they need. We can also draw an analogy for our spiritual lives to John 6, verse 35, where Jesus Christ tells his disciples, I am the bread of life, showing us that we need Christ and God in our lives daily, that part of the bread. But, Jesus Christ goes on into verse 12. He says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Asking for forgiveness and asking God to teach us how to forgive and how not to hold a grudge for our fellow man. Verse 13 goes on to say, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Protect our minds, protect our hearts from sin, from sinful thoughts. For we know that sin starts in our minds and then moves to an action. And we're also praying to ask God to keep Satan away from us. It says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But then in verse 14 and 15, Christ talks about forgiving men their trespasses. He goes, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Now, this is very important in relationship respect, not only to God, but to our fellow man. The two greatest commandments, loving God and loving your fellow man. Praying is our way of talking to God. It's our side of that conversation, telling him how much we appreciate him, how much we appreciate what he does for us, thanking him for his blessings, asking him for his guidance, for expressing our needs and the needs of others. There is no end to what we can be asking God for. In the scriptures, we find Jesus Christ praying to his father on a regular basis. Through his example as God in the flesh, we can see how important prayer really is. 
you can go ahead and write some of these scriptures down, but in Mark 1, verse 35, we have Christ rise early in the morning to pray. Find your best time of the day for your conversation with God. For me, it's any time during the day. Anytime I have an opportunity to stop, it's a great time for me. Some people, it's the morning. Some people, it's the afternoon. Some people, it's the evening. Whatever is best for you. But to have that conversation is more important. Mark 8. Christ uh, asked a blessing on the food where he had the loaves and the two fishes. Matthew 14, verse 23, he prayed in the evening. So we have an example of Christ praying early in the morning and one late in the evening. Luke 6, verse 12, he says Christ prayed before choosing the apostles. So over major decisions in our lives, Christ is giving us an example. You know what? We should pray to God. And in this example, Christ prayed all night. We have examples of Christ praying before healings, after healings, to the Father's will. Before his death, though, we read this every Passover. It's one of the most heartfelt prayers in the, in the Bible. It's an example that we should follow. Christ gave us many examples, praying without ceasing. What does that really mean to you? It means you could pray at any time. Having the ability to pray. Let's go ahead for another scripture. Let's turn to Philippians 4. Philippians 4 and verse 6, 6 and 7. It's part of our attitude. It says, be anxious for nothing. But in every, everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. How do we come to God with this type of attitude? How do we not come to God with this type of attitude? Knowing who God is, coming, coming, coming to God with this type of attitude is what we should be doing. I mean, if we come to God, you know, God, please take care of this guy because he drives me nuts. Where's that attitude coming from? Okay. We should come to God praying about our own attitude in a situation, because remember, it always takes two in every situation, and we always have a side that eh, it's a little hinky sometimes. Remember Mark 11, where Jesus Christ cursed the fig tree before coming to Jerusalem? And before he drove the money changers out of the temple? Let's go ahead and turn to Mark 11. Verse, we're going to read in verse 20. All the way down through verse 26. Verse 20 through 26. This is now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. This is a key when praying. If we don't have faith that God's going to ask, do what we ask him to do. How can he actually bless that prayer? How can he do what we ask him? Verse 23 goes, for surely I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt, here's the key, in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Verse 24, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will you receive them and you will have them. Verse 25, and whatever you, uh, and uh, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against 
uh, against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Once again, a reference back to Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15. <coughs> now, some people have difficulties just kneeling. Some people have difficulties just praying in general. But it's something that we need to focus on. It's something that we need to do. Like I said, it's our part of conversation with God. Um, some quick examples is a, is a prayer journal. Sometimes it helps to write down your thoughts. In, in my notes, um, after the announcements, usually there's people who to pray for. I take those notes and transfer them over and into a prayer list. Sometimes I use that. My wife had a beautiful suggestion many, many years ago that she wanted to try out. And it works. And what she calls a, uh, a God box. So basically, she took a shoe, bo a shoe box, she cut a hole in the top, you know, she wrapped it up, put ribbon over the top, make sure that she didn't have access into the God box during the, uh, during the year. And whatever she prayed for, whatever her requests were, she wrote them down and slipped them in the God box. And then at the end of the year, you know, mind, let's back up a little bit. Now, let, let's, mind you, it's not, God help me with the lottery. I mean, it's honest things about our lives. At the end of the year, she opened the God box and she would go through each one of those prayers that she asked God for and the pile that God blessed us with was much higher than the pile that we didn't get. Excuse me for a second. <laughs> but then when we look at that pile that God did not bless us with those answered prayers, we looked at where those prayers came from. What was the foundation for those prayers? And they more, were more one-sided. And we realized that some of those prayers wouldn't have been beneficial for us in the long run as we look back on them rather than when we were in the situation right then and there. So it's something to think about. So conversation with God, our side is prayer. The other side of the conversation with God is his side. It's reading your Bible. And that's where we're going to go to next is Bible study. Second leg of our tripod. And this is how God talks to us. You know, as a young man, I was taught that God's word was a light to my feet. It was a light to the path that I was going to walk if I choose to walk this way. As I got older, I began to understand that that light to my path was just the beginning. The treasures in God's written word gives us insight for every aspect and every situation in our lives. Let's go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Second Timothy 3, verse 16. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, uh, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, scripture is given directly by the inspiration of God. What we have in the pages of his Bible is given to us by God for everything, for every good work that he would have us do. Bible study is God's way of showing us his will, how we should live, how we should approach the Sabbath day, our attitudes, 
Um, but we can get much out of Bible study, just like we could get a lot out of coming to Sabbath services, listening to a sermon online or a hookup to a midweek Bible study through the internet. You think to yourself, well, you know, I'll get my conversation with God that way. Sure, you can get your conversation with God that way, but you got to ask yourself this, where is the personal relationship between God and you. It always comes down to a personal relationship. We have to have a personal connection with our Father. Do we actually call him our Father? Where does that come from if we're only hooking in, so to speak? It's hard. Where's the direct communication? When you, when you sit down and actually turn in your Bible, to something doesn't matter with pray about it ahead of time open your bible and just start reading maybe you know nine times out of ten it's something you need to hear that's god's direct communication to us we have the example of the uh the bereans in acts 17 let's go ahead and turn our bibles there this is where we have uh paul and silas was leaving thessalonica acts 17 and verse 10 it says Paul and Silas go into the synagogue. Okay, so what does Paul do when he goes into the synagogue? He teaches. Okay, verse 11, speaking of the Bereans, says, Now the people uh, here were of noble character than those of Thessalonica. They eagerly welcomed the message, checking the scriptures. This is, I'm reading this out of the complete Jewish Bible, which says Tanakh. And you got to remember, during Paul's day and age, all they had was the law and the prophets. That's all they had. So they uh, checking the scriptures every day to see the things Paul was teaching and saying was true. So no matter if Scott is standing here or if I'm standing here or next week Eric will be standing here, we have to open our Bibles and check and see that we are speaking the truth. During the end time, we know the water, uh, the watering down of the word is going to happen. There's going to be false prophets. There's going to be false teachers. And we know that uh, Satan is a master of giving a little bit of truth and a lot of malarkey. So how do we know it's truth and how do we know it's malarkey if we're not digging into the scripture? This is what the Bereans were doing. They were searching the scriptures for what they had to see if Paul was teaching the truth. They took a personal responsibility in studying the scriptures. They gave us that example. Most of us have at least one copy of the Bible. Some of us have collections of Bibles all over the place. One of the things that helped me is I actually took the time to read the Bible in a year. I dreaded it for many, many years. I know they say you should do it. You should do, you know, you hear the pastor, you hear the preachers, you should read your Bible at least once through, through the year. Uh, it's confusing to me because there's a lot of back and forward and back and forward. And with, you know, learning disabilities and dyslexia, it's hard because that's how my mind works anyways. So one of the things I uh, enjoyed is I got myself a one-year chronological Bible, which means it's set up to go for a year to read chronologically, which means the scriptures aren't in the normal path that we think, but they're placed in order of timeline. And as I started to read, yes, just it's like, okay, I got to read the Bible this year. I'm just going to read through it. But partway through it, I'm like, wait a minute. There is a lot of history that's going on here. And as you read it chronologically, you could see the history. So partway through me reading the Bible, I bought another Bible 
it was another one year chronological Bible that had historical footnotes in it along the way. And when I read those historical footnotes along with the Bible, it actually helped me understand more about what was going on and why it was going on. It brought the Bible to life. Not that it wasn't to life in my life already, but it made it more alive. It made me understand a lot more. Even though I didn't do that till I was in my early 50s. As we read these, are, there are some things that when we're reading, obviously we just glance over because maybe we don't understand. But by putting it in order or you know, during the Passover, I always like to have my uh, harmony of the Gospels with me because there are little bits of pieces of information in all of the Gospels about the Passover. And it tends to fill in the gaps. So where I really don't glance over the areas that I had to glance over before because I didn't understand it. But as we know, we are in training to be heirs with Christ in the kingdom of God. That means leadership. Leadership in a government that nobody has seen here on earth. In Deuteronomy, the kings of Israel had a duty to copy the books of the, of the law. Let's go ahead and read that. And, and this is something that might help us out. Now, I'm not saying sit down and do a hand copy. Maybe you want to. Maybe you just want to sit down and type it out. But here's instructions given to the kings in Deuteronomy 17. We're going to pick it up at verse 18. Deuteronomy 17, verse 18 says, Also, it shall be when you sit on the throne of his kingdom, that you shall write for yourself a copy of the law in the book. Uh, from the one before the priests and the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be care, uh, careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. So here we're given instruction, the king is giving instruction, that he's to read it every day of his life. So we should take these instructions to us as well. We should also learn to fear the Lord, our God, and be careful to observe the words in the law and the statutes. But verse 20 is also very important. It says, that his heart. Make it personal. That your heart, that my heart, may not be lifted above his brethren that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left, and that he may not prolong his days, oh, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children, and in the midst of Israel. Making it personal, bringing it into our heart, helps us not lift up ourselves because we understand where we sit, when we look at God's word, and we understand, hey, I might be lacking over here, I might be lacking over here, I might need to do this better. Ooh, that's a good idea. Let's implement that into our lives. And it's not like, I'm a Christian, you're not, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong. No, we should never be comparing ourselves to other people. We should be comparing ourselves to the word of God. That's part of our Bible study. That's how God teaches us. That's how God's conversation to us is through his word, like him teaching us. These are daunting tasks when you look at trying to complete them. But rather fulfilling when they're completed. You know, you don't have to tackle something this large at first. Start small. Take a passage, just one scripture. Study that scripture. Read it. Write it. Pray about it. You've just incorporated two of the three legs of the tripod. 
leads us to the third leg of the spiritual tripod. Have you ever asked God to guide your mind and your thoughts on a particular situation? It's meditation, our thoughts, thinking about God's word. The Hebrew word for meditate comes from H 1897, Agath. It's a verb used figuratively to meaning to meditate or to ponder, meaning to think. The Greek word is uh, G3049, uh, logozamai, uh, means to put together with one's mind, to count, to come, uh, occupy oneself with reckoning or calculating, to think. Simply put, means to think deeply. There's a few examples in the Bible that use this word. One of them is Romans 8. Go ahead, just for time's sake, just go ahead and write these down. You got uh, Romans 8, verse 18 says, For I consider that the suffering of the present times are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be received, revealed in us. The word consider. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. Same word. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Once again, let's, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 7 says, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him Again, consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are as Christ. Consider this in himself. Think about things in himself. Death of thought is what we're talking about here. Meditation is our way of taking the words. God speaks to us through his Bible and reflect on them and what they say. And what he is saying to us. We do this normally with our conversations that we have with each other. You know, we're driving on the way home and going, huh, uh, did Scott really say that? Maybe he did. You, you're playing the conversation over in your head. What about playing the conversation that you have with God over in your head? Conversation that God is teaching you through his word. We have some comforting words here from uh, Joshua, uh, of, of all people, back in Joshua 1, verse 8. So let's go ahead and turn to Joshua 1, verse 8. There's a lot that uh, is in the book of Joshua that we really don't take a good look at. It's a good book to do a Bible study on. Uh, Joshua uh, 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, you shall ponder, or you shall think, you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. If you take the Bible with you, wherever you will go, you always have the word of God. You always have an opportunity to open it up and find comfort in God's word in any situation or direction. Or advice. The psalmist, all through the Psalms, we read about the psalmist and how they would meditate on God's law day and night. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 5 says, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Psalms 1914, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Uh, lastly, 
uh, last example we have here is uh, uh, verse 119, or chapter 119, 97. It says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation. It is my thoughts. Put that in there and set a meditation. It is my thoughts all the day. God's law is what we think about all day long. That's what the psalmist is, is talking about. Think about living God's way of life all day long. Meditation is deeper than just, well, yeah, I'll think about it. Meditation is after you let God know your thoughts and after you read his word, you talk to God in prayer. You think about it. You consider what God is trying to tell us. You think about what God is trying to tell us in our minds. And you take that into your heart. Taking God's word deep into our innermost parts of our bodies, making it part of ourselves. Paul gave us more instructions on how and what to meditate on which is how we take things into us. We already read Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7, but let's complete that. And we're going to couple that with verses 8 and 9. So let's go ahead and turn back to Philippians 4. Let's go. We'll start in verse 6. And we'll read all the way through verse 9 so we get the whole concept together. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, uh, be, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. Verse 8. And finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good of a good report, if there is any virtue, virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy meditate on these things the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me these do and the god of peace will be with you so paul is giving them a uh, a list of things to think about which are basically things that come right out of god's word taking the time to seriously meditate or to think, to comprehend the scriptures is a benefit we tend to overlook in our busy lives. It's vitally important to take that time to meditate, to take that time to meditate on what we study about, to take that time to meditate on what we pray about. It allows us to take the word God and into our inner parts, into our minds, and in our hearts. Find a place where you can sit, just sit. A place where you could turn off all the cares in the world, shut off life around you, and take a mental, deep cleansing breath. Open God's Word, open it to a scripture. We're studying Psalms and Bible basics. Open it up, uh, Proverbs, sorry. Proverbs, <coughs> excuse me, and Bible basics. A lot of them are, are one verses, one verse, two verse. Read the verses, just those verses. Pray about those verses, then meditate on those verses. Ask God to give you what you need to understand what He's trying to see, teach you. You know, the surveyor's tripod allows a surveyor to set up the instrument anywhere, no matter how uneven the, turn, the ground is. Using all three legs of the tripod, the instrument can be leveled properly to have a sound foundation because none of us have a solid footing underneath us. The ground is always shaking and moving and shifting. Society is always shaking and moving and shifting underneath us. The nice thing about a surveyor's tripod 
is each one of these legs is adjustable. Sometimes your prayer life is longer. Sometimes your Bible study is shorter. And your meditation is longer. These adjust based on where you are, what's going on in your life underneath you. But this plate right here stays level. So the instrument on top can work properly and turn proper angles and give you a proper perspective. When we pray, when we meditate, when we study, we allow God a stable foundation to give us proper perspective on life. I want to read, let's go ahead and read Christ's words in Luke about laying a good foundation here. Luke 6, verse 49. This is very important. It says Luke uh, 6, starting in verse 46. Sorry, I said 49 earlier. We're going to start in verse 46, we'll end in 49. It says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I, which I say? Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the floods rose, the streams beat vehemently against the house, and he could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house uh, on the earth without a foundation against which the streams beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. Sitting in services, just listening to the word is not enough. Doing something about it. Doing is the action plan to build the foundation. He who hears and does them. Verse 47. He who has an ear, let him hear. But he who has an ear, let him hear and follow that up with doing. Luke 11, verse 9, 9 and 10 says, So I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For anyone who asks, prays, receives, and he who seeks, studies the Bible, finds, and to him who knocks, meditates, does the action does that action step, it will be open. It takes all three. Our Christian lives can appear to be getting by in life by living an unbalanced life of prayer, Bible study, and meditation. But as you can see, when the transit was tilted, you get bum angles. You get wrong perspective. The transit will spin. It will turn angles. But without that good foundation, you don't have a good perspective. It's not working to its full potential. The good news is we can make the decision to start right here, right now, right where we're at, right where you're at in your life. Whether you've been in the church for many, many years or been associated with the body of Christ for many, many years, or you're hearing these words for the very first time. Draw a line in the sand, so to speak, saying today is the day. If you have a hard time praying, make a list of topics. Make a list of topics to pray about. After a while, you'll find yourself praying longer and longer and easier and easier, and it'll be more fervent. If you don't where to know where to start studying a Bible, start a program where you read the Bible for a year. Or follow the example set in Deuteronomy for the kings. Write a copy of the scriptures yourself. Make for yourself your own scripture cards. Go through the Bible. Find something that you really want to work on. Ooh, I need to work on this. I may not necessarily want to memorize it, but I need to work on it. 
So let's write it down. And then keep that scripture somewhere we can see it. Take some time and consider what you read in God's word. Dwell on those words. Take them to heart. Digest them as you are sitting at a banquet, at a feast. Make them a part of your inner thought pattern. By having a strong, a strong foundation and a balanced life of prayer, Bible study, and meditation, you maintain a stable spiritual base for God to work on and for God to build on. So let's go ahead, and uh, if you want to stand, go ahead and stand. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we'll close in prayer. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, as we humbly come before you with Jesus Christ at your right side, we thank you, Father, for your many blessings. We praise you, Father, that you are the ruler that have created all things all things that are beautiful. You've given us your word, Father, to learn, to understand how we actually are to live our lives. You've given us an opportunity that we could come before you and pray and talk to you, Father, about not only what ails us, and sometimes it sounds like a laundry list, but, you know, we come before you and we can pray about what we read in your word. And we ask you, to guide our minds and guide our thoughts into your word to develop the person that you want us to develop because we know each of us develops differently, but you know and understand how we are developing. You know that we sit and pray with you or kneel and pray or stand and pray. You know the ailments that we have and difficulties we have. You just want us to talk to you and you want us to open up to you. You know, your Bible is always handy to each and every one of us. Stir up that spirit, that Holy Spirit that you've given us to want to open the scriptures and study your word, to learn about your word, to learn more about your way of life so we can teach your way of life. And help us to meditate, Father. It's the most difficult of them all because it's something that, you know, we don't normally do is to meditate, to think about what we read, to ponder what we read. Sometimes it could just be one scripture all day long is what we're thinking about. That's okay, as long as we're doing it. Help us to think about your word, Father, and give us the strength to put all three together to create that foundation for you to build on. Now, as we depart, thank you for your holy Sabbath day, for what it gives us the opportunity to learn, the opportunity to grow, and the opportunity to fellowship. We thank you for the meal that you provided for us, the hands that made it. We ask you to bless those hands. We also ask you to bless the food that we're about to partake of to give us that physical substance that we need that we can do your will here on this earth. We thank you for all things through your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.